This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk, Douglas Tuman interviews Dr. Lawrence H. White. Dr. White is an American economics professor at George Mason University who teaches graduate level monetary theory and policy and a senior fellow of the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. He is considered an authority on the history and theory of free banking. He is a proponent of private and competitive banking. Douglas and Dr. White discussed the recent Wall Street piece titled, Does the U.S. Need a National Digital Currency? where Dr. White voiced his opinion against the national digital currency, arguing primarily that it would be costly and inefficient. Most alarming, he argues, a Fed retail account system raises serious concerns about privacy because the government would be able to track where every dollar goes. Unlike private firms that encrypt customer data, the Fed, as an arm of the federal government, can't be expected to protect users from surveillance. Dr. White argues the best way to improve the speed and convenience of dollar payments is through entrepreneurial competition, not the heavy hand of government. This is where private monies like cryptocurrencies come in. Dr. White believes cryptocurrencies should be allowed to freely compete. In the interview, Douglas shed light on the fact that Bitcoin lacks fungibility, and Dr. White was intrigued by the notion that Monero is more fungible, agreeing that if that is in fact the case, that would give Monero an advantage over Bitcoin as money. Monero Talk starts now. Dr. White, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for coming on Monero Talk. I guess my uh, pleasure. So uh, we were having you on because we recently saw um, an article where you were basically um, arguing. Um, against the idea of a Fed coin and uh, somebody else, what was her name? Nia? Nia Narula? Yeah. She was arguing. Narula. Narula. She was arguing for the idea of, of, of a Fed coin, essentially. Um, and uh, we wanted to bring you on to yeah. discuss that and many more, many other things. As, as I began to research you, um, I realized how. Uh, how educated you are in this area. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of more old school than Bitcoin itself, it seems. Um, I guess you've been well, studying. That's, that's what it says on my Twitter page. I've been studying private currencies since before they were cool. And my understanding is uh, you were even kind of thinking about these, these ideas of digital currencies as well before they were a reality. I think you had even uh, written an article at one point uh, basically claiming that something like Bitcoin never could exist. Is that is that true? I wrote a piece on uh, what kind of money would the, a free market system uh, deliver. I think that was the title. And I said, there are basically two ways to make something valuable when it's not purely a commodity, uh, one is to have a money back guarantee. So that was the model that old fashioned banknotes worked on. You could redeem them for gold or silver coin. And I said, there is another possibility, which, you could, which is you could limit the addition, limit the number in circulation in some credible way, then that could give it a positive value. But I said, I don't expect people would want that because it makes the value volatile if you fix the supply. So they do that in art prints. That was the metaphor I used, that you have numbered prints so that you know it's not going to be mass produced later after you've paid a good price for it now. Um, but I didn't think that was a viable model for currency uh, because of the fluctuating value. And I'm not sure I'm wrong yet, <laughs> but it, it was... 
it, 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 I certainly was surprised to see uh, crypto assets launched on that model and achieve the kind of market cap they've achieved. So now, now that Bitcoin does exist and, you know, we'll, we'll go into your article soon. Uh, but now that Bitcoin does exist, uh, what is your current take on it? Uh, well, it seems to be serving a certain market niche uh, fairly successfully. It's still facing the challenge of growing beyond that. So it's it's good for certain kinds of transactions and it's but it's uh, not something attractive for people to hold their rent money in because the value is so volatile. Uh, so we as economists are so bad at predicting institutional evolution that maybe I should just say we'll see where it goes from here. But it's clear that the, the challenges it's faced are pretty clear. What do you see as being the, the primary challenges for a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin to really achieve success? Well, to achieve wider use as a common medium of exchange, uh, to get people to take their pay in Bitcoin and hold their rent money and their grocery money in Bitcoin, the value would have to be a lot less volatile. Uh, and there's so that's one problem. The second is the problem of congestion that we saw in 2017 when there was a big jump in the volume of transactions. Transactions slowed down quite a bit because the Bitcoin blockchain just isn't designed to do thousands of transactions per second. Uh, and then the third is simply the status quo bias of a monetary system. Everybody wants to be paid in the stuff that they can easily spend. So there's a chicken and egg problem. You need to achieve a critical mass. Um, and sort of getting over that hump is, is a difficult part of getting a new standard of, adopted. It can be done if there are clear uh, advantages. But as a medium of exchange, Bitcoin faces this volatility problem. Okay. Do, you, do you see any uh, potential clear advantages for something like Bitcoin versus because I mean, you're, you're saying you would there would need to be a real reason uh, for Bitcoin to exist versus what we already have for it to really take hold, right? To kind of get those early adopters. Obviously, we see it kind of being used as digital gold for everyday transactions. Yeah. So do you see Bitcoin having any uh, advantages there as to why it, it might take hold? Well, uh, we see Bitcoin use going up in Venezuela, where the incumbent currency, the Bolivar, uh, is hyperinflating or on the edge of hyperinflating. Uh, but the actually preferred alternative for most Venezuelans is the U.S. dollar. And Bitcoin's advantage over the U.S. dollar has to do with uh, its censorship resistance, as they call it. Uh, it's easier to hide it from the authorities than it is to hide dollars if you're using physical Federal Reserve notes. Um, now, now this is the the Monero talk show, uh, okay. obviously. So we're we're big Monero fans here. Um, what you know, censorship resistance, obviously one thing. How about uh, the concept of you know privacy and uh, essentially being able to um exchange you know cryptocurrency without traceability do you think those are important values and something that could give a cryptocurrency an advantage versus traditional means of payment i think it's an advantage if it doesn't come with you know more cumbersomeness in using it if it's just as easy to use then yeah that sounds like an advantage uh the question is and I, we don't know a priori uh, how much are people willing to sacrifice other advantages of using uh, fiat money or commodity money or Bitcoin to use a coin that's more private. Uh, but if it's just as easy to use, the, the problem I guess Monero has relative to Bitcoin is a smaller base of users. Uh, but if you can get as many acceptance points, then 
that becomes no longer such an obstacle. Right. So the, the, the fact that Bitcoin already has the network effect seemingly going for it uh, right. is kind of the biggest issue for competing coins. So do you, do you see uh, it kind of being one coin to rule them all? Um, Cause I know you're, you've been a, a, in your, in, in your talk of currencies historically, that obviously uh-huh. hasn't been the case uh, in the past, right? There's always kind of been this competition among right. currencies, but do you think ultimately now with cryptocurrency, it will be one coin to rule them all? Well, the, the competing currencies that I studied back in the 80s <laughs> were all on the same monetary standard. So that it was a competition among bank liabilities, but not among monetary standards. But when we're talking about Bitcoin versus Monero versus dollars, those are all different monetary standards. And there, there are pretty strong network effects. Uh, be, if, to switch, to be the first one to switch into a new monetary standard makes it hard for you to interact with everybody else. So you, there is a critical mass problem, as I said before. Uh, so yeah, I do think there is um, what you might call winner take all or a strong network effect uh, to a common monetary standard. Now, so we, we talked about privacy obviously being an important attribute and something that might uh, be, you know, add uh, utility to, to these currencies. How about the concept of fungibility? Um, so obviously, um, privacy kind of stems from that and, and is related to that. But just looking at it in terms of fungibility, so every unit equals every u- other unit, um, in Bitcoin, that doesn't appear to be the case. Uh, we're seeing coins that are blacklisted. Uh, we're seeing, you know, Bitcoins that are worth more because they're virgin coins, so to speak. Do you think that's an issue and that gives something like Monero potentially an advantage uh, because it has that attribute, arguably? Well, I, this is new information to me. I wasn't aware of this discrimination among Bitcoins. Is, so people look up the uh, provenance of the particular Bitcoin and it. Oh, and they yeah. Can, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's, there's a whole industry around it. Um, there are there are companies uh, worth maybe potentially hundreds of millions of dollars at this point that uh, basically uh, analyze the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, yeah. And they're, you know, they're hired by exchanges that that feel they need to do this to meet uh, KYC AML laws, uh, uh-huh. you know, Bank Secrecy Act laws. Um, and in doing so, that what they're essentially doing is, you know, tracking certain coins and um, essentially blacklisting coins. And some coins become worth worth less and worth more depending on what their history is. And this is based on a suspicion that they are were uh, uh, acquired illegitimately. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess kind of everybody is unfortunately considered guilty now until until proven till proven in- innocent. So I think that the technology is basically used widespread by uh, a lot of these exchanges uh, just because they feel that they they need to to be yeah. in accordance with regulations. Um, and if they see that there's something fishy, if, you know, they uh, in, in tracking coins, they see perhaps that, you know, coins were previously used uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a black market or coins were previously um, uh, coin joined and shuffled uh, or coin mixed uh, mixing uh-huh. services were used, uh, then they may be flagged for those reasons. Um, so, I, so yeah, I, no. This I wasn't is, aware that know your customer was being used internally, as it were. I know it applies when you try to sell your Bitcoin for U.S. dollars. Then you have to fork over lots of IDs. But I wasn't aware that it was being applied, or that exchanges were worried about it being applied internally. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, these are the you know governments as well are are using these okay. uh, analysis companies. So well, right. If they want to pierce the veil of pseudonymity, they would do that. Right. If the, if they feel there's a, a need to investigate, um, but yeah, uh, ex- we're seeing exchanges as well using using these these uh, these services to basically analyze the blockchain. So, do you have an okay. a- opinion so, there? The same that- services are the same services are willing to use a coin where that can't be done. 
What do you, oh, you mean these exchanges? A, a, a private coin like Monero? Or what? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, so that that's kind of the big question. Um, so uh, uh, a service like Coinbase has yet to add Monero. Um, okay. They've added things like Zcash, but those have uh, optional privacy and things like Dash. Uh, but they have yet to add Monero, which is private and, and essentially fungible uh, by default. Uh, but you st- are seeing there are still large exchanges that do have it. For example, Kraken, you can purchase Monero directly with fiat. Okay. There is no, uh, you know, there is no, you know, regulation that has come down in the United States that, that says that, you know, Monero can't be sold for dollars on exchanges. But mm-hmm. I guess the idea is some are being more precautious than others is the rumor. Okay. But yeah, so so given that, do you think um, that is an issue with with Bitcoin, or does that potentially give other coins potentially an advantage into kind of becoming better money because they're fungible at the you know at the at the core protocol level? Yeah, as as long as the let's call it a privacy coin uh, gets through the gate where the, the exchanges will buy and sell it, then that seems like an advantage over uh, a coin where the privacy angle is not as strong or the anonymity is not as strong. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, regulations might potentially become an issue in cryptocurrencies? Oh, well, they already are. Like in, in the exchanges, having to conduct know your customer exercises. Mm hmm. Do you think things are going to get worse or we might get to the point where governments, for example, like the United States, hopefully start to embrace uh, the technology and see it as a uh, kind of like, you know, the advent of the Internet and, hope you know, look to take advantage of the technology rather than try to stifle it? Well, I think they need to be persuaded. I think their default mode is if it's at all suspicious in any respect, uh, let's do away with it or let's not approve of it or let's keep it in a very small corner. Um, some of my fellow economists want to do away with $100 bills because they're anonymous <laughs> and criminals use them. Never mind that millions of honest, ordinary non-criminals use them. Uh, so they have that, some people have that kind of attitude. What is ultimately your opinion there or philosophy? Do you think if something like a tool like Monero were to exist versus something like Monero, uh, Bitcoin, that's more traceable? Do you obviously you think there's potentially more utility with Monero, but do you see there being uh, philosophical issues with something like Monero because it could allow for uh, nefarious uses? Well, I believe in a presumption of innocence. Uh, so it should take something like a court order to force uh, or to allow probing be, uh, the provenance of a coin, just like it ought to require a court order to look at somebody's bank account, um, which is not true of bank accounts. The banks roll over much more easily than that. <laughs> um, so the cryptocurrency that can provide a higher level of Uh, security against fishing expeditions, uh, that would be advantageous. I guess, uh, I guess it'd be a good time to get into your article. So in the article, um, you basically make the argument uh, that something like a Fed coin is not a good idea, because it's it won't necessarily lead to an efficient system. And uh, the more compelling argument, I believe, is that it could potentially lead to a surveillance type situation, a surveillance coin like we we're talking about with Bitcoin potentially being with its lack of fungibility, uh, but controlled by the government even more so where they can at any moment track any transaction. Do you, there do you are describe least, that a little bit? There, there are at least two models for the Fed getting involved, and one is what's called FedCoin where the Fed would operate some kind of distributed ledger system. Uh, It would be like a stable coin issued by the Federal Reserve. 
I don't see much attraction to that within the Fed because of the the concerns about uh, providing uh, an arena in which criminals could operate. Uh, the what seems to be the leading model is better called Fed account than Fed coin because it's an account based system where consumers and businesses would now have biz- uh, bank accounts on the books of the Federal Reserve System. So when you make transfers, when you write checks, or when you swipe your debit card, it goes directly through the Federal Reserve System, and they can tr- the danger, uh, the privacy danger is that they can then track all your transactions if they want to, or if some other federal agency wants them to. Um, and so calling it uh, a digital currency is really a misnomer. And that's how I started the article you referred to by saying, look, let's be clear, what most people are proposing is not a currency. It doesn't have the anonymity of currency. It doesn't change hands without the knowledge of the bank system, banking system. Uh, but rather it's a, an account-based system, and then it has the following problems. Now, I, I certainly agree with you, and uh, I, I'm concerned about it, but I also see the potential uh, optimistic angle there uh, where, you know, um, if something like a Fed coin existed and it had these, these flaws, um, as long as things like Bitcoin and Monero existed, uh, there would kind of be this free open marketplace where people c- can decide how they want to use their money and potentially maybe that would force them or uh, prompt them to move into something like Monero. So also digital would fluidly work with something like FedCoin. Um, do you see a potential angle there or do you think overall it's it's a scary proposition? So you think having a FedCoin would provide some kind of shadow of legitimacy or reflected legitimacy on other coins? That well, yeah, potentially it, it becoming... Potentially it becoming uh, a bridge to uh, true cryptocurrencies. So uh, it gets people used to this idea of transacting purely digitally and kind of uh, yeah. holding these these digital assets. And then hopefully they, would, they may realize that uh, these other digital assets are more pure in form and may have better value because of their... Um, you know, their, their, their private nature. Yeah, I think that's very optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, we're already used in the, in the dollar-based transaction system to make it, sending money using your cell phone or using an app or online. Um, and so having it labeled FedCoin is not going to make that much difference to people. That difference is kind of, whether it's a distributed ledger or a unified ledger, that's behind the scenes for most people. But I don't see that making a lot of difference to the consumer. Uh, and when they looked at other coins, they would say, well, these have a fluctuating exchange rate against the dollar. And then we're back to the, the problem of network effects in uh, your choice of unit of account. Mm. Well, because also one of the arguments I think you make is if uh, everybody's kind of pushed into FedCoin um, and then cash is eliminated, it then potentially gives the government the ability to, uh, I guess, implement negative interest rates overnight or something where uh, you could yeah. kind of secretly be, be taxed, so to speak, and your money can become worth less overnight without you having the ability to kind of move into cash because cash no longer exists. So then the argument being, well, if Bitcoin and Monero exist alongside that, maybe that would push people into cryptos. Do you have any thoughts there? Uh, Negative interest rates would do that, yes. Uh, It would send people looking for something that didn't lose value uh, quite so rapidly. (laughs) Uh, in real terms, and they might be willing to tolerate some volatility of relative price. Um, so, yeah, I think I think negative interest rates would be a boon for cryptocurrencies and for other commodities, for people uh, taking their wealth and saying, well, I'm not going to hold it in dollars in an account that pays negative interest. 
I'll buy some copper or I'll buy gold or I'll buy a cryptocurrency and store it that way. And then I got some chance of having a positive return. I, I, I just, but l let me say one more thing about this uh, rationale for uh, a Fed account digital system uh, being the enthusiasm about negative interest rates, giving the Fed the option to impose negative interest rates by taking away the public's ability to avoid it by holding cash. That was kind of my entry into the whole advocacy of central bank digital currency, so-called, uh, by economists who were looking to enlarge the Fed's toolkit. Um, I discovered after this uh, Wall Street Journal piece that my debating partner had never heard of this uh, rationale. And so she's not from the e economics uh, community. She's from the tech community uh, involved in designing uh, some kind of Fed account system. And she said it's perfectly compatible what I'm advocating with the continued existence of currency. Uh, so wanting to eliminate currency is not part of the rationale of many people who are pushing for a Fed uh Fed account system, rather they just want to improve the payments uh, system, it enhance the acceptance of the dollar, really. Hmm. So this isn't just some conspiracy theory that if the Fed had the ability to uh, onboard everybody onto FedCoin, that they may potentially do this. This was actually discussed and talked about? Oh, if you read the papers by economists saying how can we eliminate currency, so that we can have negative interest rates. Aha, we can push everybody from paper currency into a digital equivalent and which, on which we can impose negative interest rates. Um, and they think that the ability of Fed to impose negative interest rates without constraint from pe people being able to avoid them is a positive thing. I don't see it that way. <laughs> I see it as a bad thing for consumers. Yeah. I, from the macroeconomic planning perspective, they think it's a good thing. Yeah, cer certainly scary stuff. Um, but then, yeah, once there are economists who are quite explicit about wanting to eliminate cash, whether or not there's a, a digital currency. So Ken Rogoff, who I debated uh, about a year ago in New York, has a book called The Curse of Cash. And so he would like to eliminate at least hundreds and fifties and then probably twenties and then we can talk about tens. Hmm. But then just going back to that point, I mean, so you're also obviously a, a, a big advocate for the free market and letting uh, currencies compete. So ultimately, like we said, couldn't, right. couldn't that be then be a good thing? So everybody, you know, cash is eliminated, uh, you know, everybody's using Fed coin, but then they're realizing waking up, literally waking up to the fact that, you know, uh, it's being manipulated and, and their value is going down and that then pushing them into the, the open market of currencies where then they hopefully choose something more effective. Well, I don't want to push people into using cryptocurrency by eliminating an option they currently prefer. That doesn't make them better off. I prefer re removing obstacles that stop them from using cryptocurrencies, but I don't want to, you know, manipulate people's choices in that way. So where do you see this all ultimately going? I mean, do you have any, uh, I know it's very hard to say, but uh, I mean, we're seeing, you know, obviously I think the, it's fair to say the U.S. government is seriously considering it, this at this point. Uh, we heard the Fed chairman talking about it uh, a few weeks ago. Actually, he was kind of remarking that uh, he doesn't really see something like this potentially being popular because because of the privacy implications, um, but yeah, he very encouragingly said he doesn't want to be in the position of being able to peer into everybody's bank account. Right, uh, he didn't think the federal government should be able to do that. So, and that's and, good to hear. And he thinks something like that can can go over well in, in a place like China, but not in the United States, where uh, there's these exactly, expectations yeah. of privacy. But you do see like that, you know, even even during that meeting, the congressman kind of pushing him and 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 suggesting that, well, what are we going to do if if, you know, 
uh, China coin exists and, you know, U.S. Fed coin doesn't exist, does that put us at a disadvantage? So there does really seem to be real consideration here. Um, and I think there was some stat that like 30 percent of central banks say that they're likely to launch um, a digital currency in the next six years. Ten percent already have pilots. So what? Where do you uh -huh. where do you see it ultimately going? Do you think there there will be some sort of uh, U.S. Fed coin? How, how do you see it playing out? I think the most legitimate concern about the current system is the slowness with which some payments clear on the current Fed clearinghouse system. Uh, what I would like to see is the Fed speeding that up. And one simple step they could take is to have the clearinghouses open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're actually closed on weekends, which is why if you deposit a check on Friday, you don't get the money till Monday. That's pretty old fashioned. They can improve on that. They don't need uh, people to have accounts directly at the Fed in order to improve that situation. We see remittance companies like TransferWise able to make dollar payments in, it used to be days and now it's 15 minutes. Uh, the payment is cleared. Uh, so that's what I would like to see. And then then, then there's no need for a digital currency uh, run by the central government. I'm happy with all kinds of digital currencies in the private sector, uh, neither subsidized nor uh, stifled by legal restrictions. Um, and the, the future for uh, cryptocurrencies, I think, is to, to make them more user friendly. Uh, and I, I think there's some possibility for uh, stable coins, coins that keep the volatility of purchasing power down. If they can do that in a credible way, being adopted in other countries other than the United States that want to use dollars without the inconvenience of using paper currency. Uh, and they don't have access to U.S. banks, but having a dollar denominated coin, uh, electronic coin, can serve that purpose. People who want privacy should be able to use privacy coins. So uh, I think there is a niche there to be served. I, without s some great failing on the part of uh, established fiat currencies, it's going to be hard for alternative units of account to get a big foothold. Hmm. And then, so what do you see even more long term? Um, so, you, so you would like to see kind of the the Fed just um, improve its current system without creating a Fed coin. Uh, you think that right. uh, it could, there's ways it can make its system more efficient without uh, going to the lengths of creating a Fed coin. And you think even if it does, that would create inefficiencies. Um, and then you think kind of if it tries to run a retail payment system, yes. Uh, national governments are not good at retail businesses. <laughs> you can see that in the post office. You can see that in uh, other places. Uh, the Canadian government has its own chain of gas stations and they lose money. And right. loses money, so on and so forth. And they're probably not necessarily good at designing uh, digital currencies. I mean, I think we've even seen that with and Ecuador. There's certainly, less, there's certainly less innovation when it's run by the government. Right. As opposed to letting it freely developed open source as, as we're seeing with cryptocurrencies. Um, so yeah, then let, let, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let people who think they see a profit opportunity try to grab it. And if they succeed, that's great. If they fail, they bear the cost, not the taxpayer. So then what is your long term view of crypto? So like we said, there, you know, you do think there might be this tendency of one coin to rule them all, given kind of the, the, the network effects of money um, and the fact that now all this money would, be, you know, would, would be digital. So it's a little bit different than than and digital and, and not depending on uh derived from the same asset of, of gold. But um, so right. do you then see that eventually eating up uh, things like fiat as well? 
Well, if there's a rise in fiat inflation rates and volatility of purchasing power of fiat currencies, then people will start to look for alternatives like they do in Latin American countries when the peso starts to uh, hyperinflate. Um, I'm following with interest the attempts to put a gold on a blockchain so that it can be traded uh, much more easily. But it, there you have, of course, other problems of know your customer rules and physically getting the gold out can be quite expensive, uh, especially if you're talking about small amounts. But it'll be interesting to see the competition between gold and cryptocurrencies. There are more, there's more gold in private hands than there is cryptocurrency in private hands. So there's already a slightly bigger, uh, a bigger established base of users. Actually, it's about 10 times bigger if you count everybody who holds coins or bullion or ETFs in gold. Uh, but it's not as easy to tran transact with yet as cryptocurrencies. It'll be interesting to see what happens when it becomes easier to transact with. And hopefully the regulators won't quash that. So if fiat currency blows up, then we'll see a movement either into cryptocurrency or into um tradable claims to gold. Um, how about uh, current events? Like, uh, you know, we're seeing the coronavirus right now. It's obviously had a very large effect on the stock market. Uh, there's talks of what, you know, the Fed right. may do in response. Do you think events like that will potentially start to have crypt trigger crypto to act more like gold? What, what do you mean act more like gold? Well, I mean, as, as a, you know, a, 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 an, an uncorrelated asset that people can, can reliably move their money into. I mean, I think there's going to be events that like trigger that movement. Uh, I, we're currently not seeing that with the coronavirus, right? I mean, the crypto market is going no, down. The price of gold is down, actually. Yeah, it's going down in tandem. And I guess the price of gold as well. Um, but if not Corona, do you think some there's going to be some other events where we start to see crypto act like an uncorrelated asset and start to act more like gold? And why aren't we seeing that now with the with this event with the coronavirus? Well, uh, other things equal, the coronavirus reduces the output of the economy, and so that should lead you to expect higher inflation. Uh, and so that's a reason to diversify away from existing currencies. Um, and especially in the case of gold, uh, gold the, the cost of mining gold goes up if your labor force is sick with the coronavirus. Uh, so that becomes an attractive option. And even but Bitcoin miners potentially have, in China. We'll have to figure in what, what reaction the Fed is going to make to this. Um, so there's a lot of guessing about what the Fed's response is going to be. Uh, but the price of treasury bonds has gone up. That seems to be the first haven, of, the safe haven of preference. Although that seems to me a curious response if you realize that the risk of inflation has gone up. So I, I guess I guess we'll just have to have to see. Um, the market thinking differently from the way I'm thinking. <laughs> and then so more along these lines too of, of uh, you know, Bitcoin and Monero kind of acting as acting as gold. Um, Bitcoin is Bitcoin is capped. Um, it has cap supply, as you know. Right. Um, what, what's your opinion there in terms of how that potentially affects the long term use of Bitcoin? as you know uh, a world reserve currency is it is that potentially an issue um causing well it, it gives bitcoin credibility that its value won't be inflated away by uh, more issues of it than people expected so it's important for bitcoin not to change the release schedule i mean that would just completely undo its credibility but from the, uh, the, the the idea of it potentially causing, you know, deflation. Um, uh, so 
we have historical experience with gold standards in which there were periods where the economy's output of goods and services grew faster than the supply of gold. And then you had a downward trend in the prices of goods and services because you had more goods chasing each ounce of gold. But that's a good thing. It means people's standard of living is going up by means of goods getting cheaper and cheaper. And goods are easier to produce because they're technical improvements. There's no reason why their price shouldn't go down. Uh, so that's a very benign kind of deflation. It's very different from a depression in which the reason there's deflation is that there's a sudden drop in the supply of money. This is deflation because of increase in the supply of goods. So I don't see that being a negative, and so I don't see the limited issue of uh, Bitcoin or any other currency that's set up that way uh, being a negative thing. Okay. Yeah, Min Monero, I don't know if you're aware, Monero actually isn't capped. Um, it has a nominal supply of around 18 million, which it hits in 2022. And, you know, it's a, uh -huh. it's a smooth curve to that point. And then thereafter, um, there's a tail emission where a small amount of Monero is continually issued. 2% a year or how is it calculated? It's uh, 0.6 XMR per block. So essentially every two minutes, another 0. 0.6. So it's, it's consistent. So it's actually, uh, I guess, disin, uh, deinflationary, right? So it's, it's not, um, you know, it's, 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 can you, can you give that to me in percent per year? Uh, well, it would be going down, right? So the total supply would be going up. So it, it's, it's essentially like it's a, it's tending towards zero in, in inflation over time because okay. eventually you know that that point two is going to be uh minimal compared to the existing amount of monero because it's a it's a but constant... the release schedule the release schedule is known it's in the yeah the uh, release schedule code. yes so, and then it's all priced in right so but do you think that ha that may be uh viewed differently in terms of uh Econ you know, economics in terms of this, I, you know, this argument that uh, a cap supply uh, may cause issues because it's deflationary, or do you think ultimately it'd be viewed the same? Um, I think ultimately the same. Uh, it, it does imply a different inflation path if you have a positive emission rather than zero emission beyond some point. Uh, but Presumably, there's a reason to have additional emissions, and that's rewards for the miners. Is that the idea? Yeah, correct. So it, it guarantees. So then, if you have if you have rewards for the miners, then you need smaller. You don't need fees quite as large. Correct. So that's an offsetting advantage to yeah. the deflation rate being not quite as low, <laughs> not quite as big negatively. <laughs> Yes. Yes. So, Min so Min Monero is not relying on uh, transaction fees in the future. It's just right. going to continue to rely on um, minor fees. So a mix of smaller transaction fees uh, and, and less deflation would be more attractive to people who actually want to spend it and less attractive to people who just want to hodl it. Yes, that that that's the thought to make it a, an actual working currency. Yeah, and I I think cryptocurrencies have to have some prospect of that uh, to attract uh, adopters. And then the the other component of that, which I'm, I don't know if you're aware, is that the the block sizes in Monero are dynamic, um, so they expand and contrast. Uh, with, you know, essentially the demand of the network. Okay, so that avoids congestion problems. Yes. That's a good thing. Yeah. So uh, let me see if I have any other questions here. I mean, so this is one of the wonderful things about the cryptocurrency market is people who can think of ways to improve on the Bitcoin design can launch them and see how they fly yeah and then so do, do you have any um obviously you know you're you're well versed in monero i mean in bitcoin 
Um, but do you have any other coins that, that you're looking at that you see potential in? Uh, I have consulted Beam, the, which is another privacy coin based on the Mimble Wimble protocol. Uh, and they have a, an interesting uh, sort of approach to privacy, which is uh the chain is is not observable from outside unless you the owner decide to make it observable so if you get a court order that says you need to turn over that information uh it's possible to do it yeah monero has that feature as well it's called view keys in monero so you could provide somebody a view key and they can see your oh, okay. transactions uh, just curious, you know, this being the Monero show, obviously, uh, me uh, constantly bringing you back. Is there a reason why you haven't investigated Monero more deeply or it just uh, hasn't been on your radar? Uh, I'm, I've been aware of Monero and Zcash. Uh, I haven't investigated the nitty gritty because I have a limited amount of time. <laughs> and there are other issues that uh, I also work on, like central bank digital currency, dollarization, banking regulation. But uh, I'm, I'm interested now. <laughs> yeah, I, I highly encourage you to look at uh, the, the community, you know, take a deeper look at it. The community is great on Reddit. Um, one of the things about Monero, I think people, people in Monero try to stay honest about the project. And so in, in realizing that it may not be the one, um, but hoping that it is and trying to iterate and improve towards that, towards becoming digital cash. So uh, if you did get involved and went to the Reddit, you would be welcome with open arms and everybody I'm sure would, <laughs> would be happy to answer all your questions. Okay, okay good. good. <laughs> but uh, th thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing the show. I really appreciate it. Is there any well, other sure. of interest to your listeners? Is there, yeah, no, this is, this has been a, a great show, great topics. Is there anywhere where people can kind of follow you further? Do you have uh, any resources that you want to share? Yeah, so I blog at a site called Alt M. So it's alt m.org. And that's a blog hosted by the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. And so I have a piece there about once a month. Uh, they can, people can follow me on Twitter where it's Lawrence H white one is my handle. Uh, and you can Google me and find, uh, my research papers, technical papers, uh, academic research that's been posted. Uh, my first book, which is called free banking in Britain is available as a free PDF from, uh, a think tank. Uh, in Great Britain called the IEA, Institute for Economic Affairs, IEA dot, what is it, co.uk, I think. <laughs> but uh, you can Google that. And if you want to read about the history of 19th century free banking, uh, do that. All right. Thank you. I guess, one. so do you see any parallels there between, um, you know, uh, 19th century banking and we're in the cryptocurrency space? Well, they're both uh, competition in the currency arena. Uh, sl different institutional arrangements as between a commodity standard and each currency its own standard. But I, I think there are interesting parallels. And so I've been quite happy to see that this research I did that was quite obscure and uh, only of interest to a few economic historians, uh, having more wide application. Uh, and the some of the people early on involved in, uh, before Bitcoin was launched, people like Hal Finney and Nick Zabo, uh, I was in touch with through user groups uh, where these kind of issues were discussed. So... I like to think that my research had some small uh, impact on this development. Very cool. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for coming on, Dr. White. Uh, hope to 
you know, maybe have you on again in the future if you if you'd be willing to. Okay. And sure. uh, I'll certainly be uh, following you and, you know, on the lookout for any new articles or things you might publish. Okay. Good talking to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.